Hey everybody, welcome back to Family Friday where we are tackling the Bible basics. I'm George Willette, youth and family uh, minister here at the Westport Christian Church. We're going through apologetics, this, this idea that as believers we are required to be able to give a defense and a, a reason, that's what, that's what apologetics means, for the hope that is within us. And for these first you know, few lessons, we've been kind of going over some more technical stuff um, in, in the science, and, and I know that for some people that maybe was a bit much, and I, and I understand. And, and I want you to stick with me, because again, it's not that you have to be an expert at all of this stuff. We just have to be capable of explaining why we believe. And I just want to give you a couple of ideas that there are good reasons for faith. There are reasons why I believe that God is the right answer to everything we see around us in nature. Today, lesson eight, we're going to go on reasons for faith in philosophy. Uh, now, philosophy is the study of theories of truth, of creation, of the way that we should live, how things begin. And what's interesting is there are people, and, and I've discussed this with a lot of people who don't believe, especially people who identify as atheist or agnostic, and what they're relying on is, is hard science. They want proof, they want proof, they want proof. And when they say that, they're talking about hard science, something that is repeatable in a lab. And the truth is that science doesn't answer all questions. Science answers some questions about nature, about the world around us, about rocks and trees. And, but there's other things that science can't answer. And that's going back to those, that idea of truth and that idea of logic that we talked about at the very beginning. There are things that just make logical sense. This is where our ability to think and reason comes from. So I want to walk us through an argument from philosophy that I believe is exceptionally strong. I think it only makes sense that there is a creator when you think of this. And here it is, what's called the moral law. Now, what do I mean by this? This is how the argument would go is that for every law, there has to be a lawgiver. If there's something that we're obligated to do, something we're supposed to do, then we know that someone has told us we should do that. There is a moral law that, that there's definitely absolute right and wrong. There are things that are good and there are things that are bad. There are things that are good, there are things that are evil. That's what we have to, to, to ask the question of, is there a moral law? Because if so, then there's a moral law giver. There's someone apart from us, outside of us, that has placed this moral law in us. So let's look into it. There's a, a Christian writer, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was uh, an academic, a professor, a, a, an author. You've probably heard of his books or watched movies that are based off of his books. Um, he wasn't always a believer. He was actually an atheist, and he was arguing against faith and what he found out, the studying that he did, he convinced himself that not only was it reasonable to believe in a God, but it was reasonable to believe in the God of Christianity. And during World War II, he gave a number of talks on the radio during wartime. They collected them, and it's a book called Mere Christianity. And if you've not read it, I would advise you to go out. If you're a believer or if you are just wondering about Christianity, and read this book. He's not arguing for a specific denomination. He is just saying these are the basic things that we mean when we say Christianity. And when talking about morality, when talking about right and wrong, this is what he says. Everyone knows certain principles. Uh, there's no land where murder is a virtue and gratitude a vice. Okay, so what he's saying is that wherever you go, this seems to be hardwired into people, that to commit murder is not seen as being something good. And we're having gratitude and appreciation towards other people is not seen as looking bad. 
He goes on and he says, think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle. Or, or where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. Now that sounds simple and most people go, well, of course that's common sense, but think about what he's actually saying. Why is it this way? Why do all of us tend to have <clears throat> these responses that are, that are in us of either lifting up and praising something good and other things we see as being bad? And he also talked about how you can kind of know this moral law, even if you don't follow it, the guy who, who does double cross everybody. Yeah, he can do that. But he will still know there's a moral law because look at how we react when someone offends against us. If someone treats me poorly, if someone steals from me, if someone double crosses me and I get upset, the question is, well, why am I upset? Why would I think that there's anything wrong with that at all? Where does that sense of right and wrong come from? The founding fathers of, of this country, the United States of America, knew this, that there was this moral law. This is what they wrote at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, we tend to lose this thought in, in the argument about politics today. But it is inarguable that the founders of this country, by and large, believed that there was a creator and that we as humans were given certain rights, not by the government. This is not mankind making up the rules for mankind. These are inalienable rights, that we are born having the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We now live in a country where many people think that it's government that gives us our rights. Government protects our rights. Government is to um, help us to point society to what's right and what's wrong. But we've gotten so far away. Again, we live in a post-modern, post-Christian country now where people want to argue that there's actually something like truth or that there's good and bad. And we as believers, as Christians, need to be able to explain why it's true that certain things are just good and certain things are bad. Now, when we talk about the moral law, people will say, okay, well, there's a moral law, but not everybody follows it. Yes, that's true. People can reject the moral law just like people can break the laws of the town that you live in or the state you live in or the country you live in. And what happens to those people who break the law? They're punished. They're seen as being bad. They're, they're seen as being a problem. Uh, and people who habitually break the law or offend against people in the society they live in to great extent are seen as being worse. Think about the language here. This is not stuff that you prove in a lab. This isn't stuff you prove scientifically, but you know it's true. When we read about serial killers who have, for their own twisted pleasure, gone out and killed dozens and dozens, if not even more people, we know that there's something fundamentally broken about them because that's just not right. When we talk about the moral law, you've got to understand that it is the basis for all human rights. Think about it. If there's not this moral law that's given to us, then what's wrong with killing people? What's wrong with burning down people's houses? What's wrong with um, not working and, and taking whatever you want from the store without paying for it? If I get to decide for myself, or we as a society get to just decide what's right, what's wrong, then that means that it can change. 
but you know deep down inside that there are things, certain fundamental things that never change, that they're either good or they're bad, they're right or they're wrong. The last thing is that the moral law is the foundation for all justice. This is a big topic in America today, 2021. We have had protests for the last couple of years about the injustice. We are having discussions about critical race theory. We are having discussions about uh, the rights of women. And, and these are all necessary conversations to have. But all too often in the, in the conversation, we're missing, what are we actually talking about? If we are just the sum of our parts, if there's nothing higher than ourselves, if there is no moral lawgiver, if we're just kind of higher thinking animals, why do we care about justice? The lion doesn't care when he eats the zebra. It's the survival of the fittest. It's, it's the strong dominating the weak. But we know that's not right when it comes to humans. We know that we should take care of the poor and the infirm and the vulnerable. And we know that everyone should be treated a certain way because they're born as image bearers of God. That's what Christianity teaches. And that believers should understand that God does desire justice from us to help the poor and the weak, and to punish the wicked. That's the job of government. That's the job of us as individuals to, to participate in this redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Without the moral law, without something outside of ourselves, then none of this makes sense. And people can just do whatever they want. And if they're strong enough to force their way through, then there's nothing wrong with it. But once again, we know, even if that we look around and people are living that way, we know it's wrong. So here, real interesting. This is a way to think about this. Here's a bunch of sticks. I would ask you, I need a straight stick. So give me a straight stick. And each of you would look and you would pick the one that you thought was straightest. My question for you is, how do you know what straight is? Because none of those are actually straight. You know which one is the straightest because there's something outside of those sticks. There's something else that is the measure of what straight is. This is a yardstick. See, it's the model, it's what we judge straight by. So I want you to think about this. When we use the words good and evil, when we use the, the, the words right and wrong, justice or injustice, where does that measurement come from? Where did the idea of something good start? The truth is, science will tell you nothing about that. They, they want to come up with all these different theories, but there's no test that you can do. And the truth is, you can't even say that, well, we make it up ourselves as just high-functioning animals that live in groups. So we're trying for the best for the group because that's not how nature works. Tons of examples. But I'll tell you, gorillas, highland gorillas, um, need animals. The, the leader of the, the family, the leader of the group, the silverback, if a female comes into the group with a baby, oftentimes he will kill that baby. Or if a new silverback comes in, he will kill all of the babies that are in the group before he got there. 
he, he's exerting his control. He is doing what he can by his instinct. And we don't look at those animals that do that and go, that's evil. That animal needs to be punished, to be jailed up, to be arrested, to be executed. Now, we may not like it. It may offend us because we project onto them, but we know it's just an animal doing what an animal does. Humans. When a father goes into a family, when there's a step family situation, and this man meets this woman and she has another child, it is unconscionable to us to think that it would be okay for him to go in and kill that baby. Or if another female came into his family with children. When we see things like this going on, when we see non-biological parents getting together with, with people who have kids and treating those children poorly, abusing them and sometimes even killing them, we know that that is evil. So we don't think about this very often as being a, a reason for belief because we're overwhelmed by how normal this is. It just makes sense that this would be good or this would be bad. But the question is, why? And we don't get to make that decision. It is someone higher than us a higher power who is the source of good, who is the, the ruler, who is that, that measurement of what good looks like, who says this is goodness. And anything that does not align with that person, that's what's evil. Now there's a lot of debate that goes on, you know, what about evil in the Bible? A lot of the evil in the Bible is what the Bible is recording as having happened. It doesn't approve of it. And then acts that the Bible talks about that God did this. Again, this weekend I'm preaching on the flood narrative, on Noah and the flood. Watch it online. It's on our, it's on our Facebook page. It's on our YouTube channel. It will be it's come Sunday. And we will talk about why that is not evil what's really going on there. And you can explain and understand what God is doing in those events. But it doesn't change the fact that from a very real point of view, using logic, that the fact that there is a moral law is a powerful argument for God. You may not like it. You can reject it. But it's still there and it's a good reason for me. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and I thank you so very much for this day. I thank you for this time you've given us. And, and Father, I hope that these lessons on apologetics help us to understand that as believers, there are good reasons, real reasons, that we have put our faith, our trust, our hope in you. Will you use this to help us to share you with other people? And if there are people who don't yet believe, Will you use this to just help them to ask questions, to search out for you, to maybe move just one step closer for their good, but for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.